Well, this morning we are wrapping up our Awaken series. And uh, it's been a really cool few weeks. If you haven't been with us, what we've been doing is really unpacking this concept that God spoke to us at our Awaken conference that was a couple of weeks ago. And, and God really deposited through our incredible guest speakers a whole bunch of stuff. He deposited stuff and there were some prophetic words that God spoke to us in the midst of that conference. And so in week one of the series, what we said is that we need to wake up from a few things. That as a church, you know, it, we, we, need, we can say that as a church we need to wake up. But it's not up to the church to do it. We can't say, oh, the staff will do it, or the pastors will do it, or even the volunteers will do it. We can't be an awakened church if we have slumbering members. We've all got to awaken. We've all got to wake up. And so we said we've got to wake up from this uh, autopilot, this just going through the motions mentality. We've got to wake up from just the bare minimum Christianity. And we've got to wake up from this individuality, this me over we kind of idea. And then Pastor DJ preached a phenomenal message last week about we need to wake up to the idea of who Christ is in us, our identity in Christ Jesus. And so we've spoken about those two things over the last couple of weeks. And so to wrap up this week, I want to preach a message very briefly called The Other Side. That's what we're going to speak about this week. And, And really the whole concept, don't you love that picture? Sometimes I get so excited when I'm preparing for a message when I just find a nice picture. And I'm like, let's just put this in. I'm like, and hopefully that'll make sense as we go through this. But anyway, so this morning, the message, the other side, is I want to challenge us churches. What's on the other side of us waking up as a church? You know, we, we can, if we want, stay here. We can be a slumbering church. We can be a church that's on autopilot. We can be a church that settles for the bare minimum. We can be a church that, that is all about me, myself, and I. We can be a church that is blind to the identity that Christ wants to give us. We can be that kind of church. But that's a church that is blind to the abundant life that Christ promised us in the Gospels. And so we've got to be a church that crosses over from sleep to awakened, from, from a church that's, that's blind to a church that has its eyes opened. We've got to cross over to the other side, church. And so that's what I want to awaken us to this morning. What's on the other side of us waking up? You know, what's on the other side? What's, what's in that brand new day? And so before we do that, let's pray. Let's begin by prayer. God, we want to thank you that today it's not about what I've got to say. It's about what you've got to say. And I know that as much as I can shout, and it's all about open hearts and open minds. It's about how hungry we come to receive from you. And so, God, I pray for a sense of hunger in this place this morning. I pray for a sense of hunger on the other side of every screen on our online location, Lord God. And so, God, I pray that you would stir up a hunger inside of us. I pray that there would be open hearts and open minds to receive of your word this morning. Holy Spirit, would your voice be the loudest voice in this room? I pray that not a single word from me would come out, but only your words would come out. And so, God, I do pray that we would all leave here changed this morning transformed by the power of you, Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Cool, are we ready? Look at someone, you don't have to touch them, but just say, I'm ready. Awesome. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, you can turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. And uh, really what we're going to be looking at is the day the church woke up. Right. So before Acts chapter 2, The church was in an embryonic stage. We know that Acts chapter 2 talks about the birth of the church. Often when we talk about the day of Pentecost, we talk about the birth of the church. But another way of looking at it is the day the church woke up. It was the first day the church opened its eyes. It was the first day the church got a glimpse of what it could be. And it was the day the church crossed over from sleep to awakened. It was the day the church crossed over from being an embryonic stage to being alive and fruitful in the world. And if we, if we understand this, the world has never been the same again because the church crossed over. The church went to the other side, and the world has never been the same. And church, I believe that God is calling Liberty Church to cross over, not for our sake, but for the world's sake. I believe the world is waiting for a church to wake up, for a church to be unleashed, because the world needs the gospel. We're not just going through the motions to be a nice religious little group to keep doing churchy things. No, there is a world on the other side of our walls, on the other side of our homes that needs us to wake up. And so we need to cross over. 
And so the book of Acts chapter 2 says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to rest, appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you've been in a Pentecostal church more than about two seconds, which is what this church is, we're a Pentecostal church. In other words, we believe that the day of Pentecost was the beginning of everything we experience. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe in speaking of tongues. So we're a Pentecostal church, right? And so if you've been in a Pentecostal church more than about five seconds, you will have heard incredible men and women preach on this passage better than I ever could. But what I want to do today is I want to bring out a couple of thoughts that this passage shows us about what it means to be an awakened church. What does it mean to have your eyes opened, church? What should it mean for us to cross over? And the first thing it says there is when the day of Pentecost arrived. Everything that happened on this day, it was the day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost is not something Christianity invented. Okay, The writer of the book of Acts, Luke, didn't go, what's a nice name the day the church was born? Let's call it Pentecost. Right? That's not what he did. No, the day of Pentecost was already a day in the Jewish calendar. They just happened to all be gathered, and God chose that day to birth the church. Now, what is the day of Pentecost and and why was it so significant? Like so many things in our Christian calendar, when we see it through the lens of Jesus, it takes on such significance. But in order to understand it, we need to go back and understand its origins. The day of Pentecost, if you're reading the book of Leviticus, first of all, well done. You know, well done, good on you. But as you read through the book of Leviticus, you'll come across this feast called the Feast of of weeks, and, and it's, it, it, in other translations, it'll be called the, 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 the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost is 50th. It's 50 days after the celebration of Passover. And we know Passover. Passover is when the, the, the Israelite nation was brought out of Egypt. It was a salvation moment. It was literally when God rescued Israel with a mighty hand, with the passing over of the angel of death. He saved them by the blood of the Lamb. And so God rescued them. 50 days later, we celebrate the day of Pentecost. Now, I'm not one of those preachers where every time I see a number in the Bible, I get all excited and I'm like, yay, numbers. I mean, there is a book in the Bible called Numbers, but that's beside the thing. But Pentecost is important because Pentecost literally speaks about the 50th. So why is 50 important? Well, I'm going to give us a little bit of a a number journey here. This isn't mass, but stay with me, please. Okay, so for those of you who hated maths, stay with me for a moment. Seven, I've left 50. Let's put a pin in 50 for a moment. Okay, put a pin in 50. Seven is God's perfect number. Okay, seven is God's perfect number. Now, seven sevens is perfection of perfection. It is the absolute complete number. Number. So when you set, uh, when you time seven by itself, God sees that as the completion of completion, the perfection of perfection. That's why when the disciples come to Jesus and talk about forgiveness, God, Jesus, how many times must I forgive? Jesus goes overboard and he says, you must forgive him 70 times seven. Because what he's actually saying is, don't work 70 times 7 out in your head. I'm not giving you an, a, a mathematical equation. I'm telling you that from heaven's perspective, forgiveness always needs to be complete and without limitation. That's what Jesus was communicating. But now 7 times 7 is complete. It's 49. It's the, it's the absolute completion of things. So when you reach the number of 49, in Hebrew counting, in Hebrew understanding, it was the completion of things. It was the, it was the absolute perfection of things. So 50, bear with me here, I think my math is correct, 50 is 49 plus 1. Right? I think someone should give me a PhD in mathematics, I'm just saying. 50 is 49 plus 1. In other words, it's perfection plus 1. It's a brand new start. 
50 is brand new start. In other words, when you look at the, the writings in Leviticus and in the Old Testament, they had this thing called the year of Jubilee. It was the 50th year in their calendar. And on the day of atonement, they would blow a trumpet. And in the year of Jubilee, here's what happened. Every debt was canceled. If you were a Jewish slave, you were freed. There was no war during that year. There was no work during that year. Nothing from the past 49 years came with you into the 50th year. The year of Jubilee was a brand new start because your 49th year, everything was finished. It was completed. The year of 50 was a clean slate. It was a brand new start. That's what 50 represents in the, in the Bible. Pentecost was a brand new start. The birth of the church, it's not an accident that God descends to breathe his spirit and bring his church to an awakened state on a day called Pentecost. God says, I'm going to breathe my spirit upon you. I'm going to awaken you, church, on a day that signifies a brand new start. In other words, church, I'm giving you a brand new slate. You don't have to carry with you the baggage of an old religious system. You don't have to carry the baggage with you of the things of the past. I'm giving you a brand new slate because I've signed a brand new covenant in my blood. And so church, what does Pentecost mean for us? Why, why is it significant? Because I believe, church, that God is calling us to awaken to the idea that he's calling us to a place of a brand new start. We sang this morning, God, you're doing a new thing. Don't you love that song? We can sing those words. Do we believe what we say? It's one thing thinking it, God, you're doing a new thing. Yay! It's one thing singing it, right? But what does it mean living it? Can we live from a place where we believe that we believe that the day of Pentecost has come and as the church we're living from a blank slate? That the past is gone. The things that used to define us no longer define us and we are a brand new people because of the blood of Jesus. And that freedom is not licensed to keep sinning. Paul writes this. The freedom, that that new blank slate is not freedom to do what we want. That freedom is a license to give God glory. And so church, God's calling us to awaken to the fact that it is a brand new day. We have a blank slate. We have a free check. We can do whatever we want to bring Him glory. Not what we want to indulge the flesh. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, don't misunderstand me here. But God's saying, church, you've got a new day. You've got a blank slate. The things of the past no longer define what I'm calling you to today. Awaken to this. Awaken to this. And then it says that they were all there in one place, united. Not Manchester United. That's the wrong thing. We don't bring devils into the house of the Lord. Not the red, it's not the red, it's, no. I'm sorry, we still love all Manchester United fans. We do love you. We do love you. We love you. We love you. But it says they were united. And you know, God pours out his spirit on a united people. On people who are on one heart and one mind. I think it's so beautiful because there's, beauty, there's power, there's influence where there's unity. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 17, he's praying what we know as the high priestly prayer. It's a prayer that Jesus prays just before he goes to the cross, just before he's crucified. He prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and then he says, I'm praying for those who will believe in me through the words of the disciples. In other words, he prays for you and me. He prays for the future church. And if I can summarize his prayer, essentially he prays this. May they be one so that through their unity the world may know me. Let that sink in. May they be one so that through their unity the world will know me. In other words, in Jesus' mind and in his heart, he believed our greatest evangelical and missional tool was our unity. 
The best thing we have to show the world Jesus is not flashy lights, is not crusades, is none of that. The best option, the best tool we have to show the world Jesus is unity. The fact that I can sit next to and stand next to people who are fundamentally different to me and worship the same Jesus is the best thing we have to show the people Jesus. You don't have to look like me, smell like me, support a soccer team like me. It doesn't matter. I can be fundamentally different to you and that's a good thing because that's going to show the world Jesus. Can we be a united church? Or are we going to stay this side and be a church that's all about me? Because if I'm a church that's all about me, I want everything else to look like me. I want the person sitting next to me to look and smell like me, to come from the same neighborhood as me. But if I'm a church that's fighting for unity, that protects unity, that knows unity is my best testimony, then it doesn't matter who's next to me. What matters is the God I worship with the person next to me. I feel like that's better than just worth a polite clap. If we understood how important unity is. In fact, if you want to know how important unity is, read the words of Paul. Paul, you could see in his words, got angry with people who were divisive. People who came against the unity of the church. And Paul had these words. If there's someone who's going to sow division, kick them out. Have zero to do with them. He didn't say, no, no, no. Take time. Bring them in. Disciple them. Nah, nah. If he was a good South African, he would have had other terms to what to do with them. There would have been a whole other vocabulary that came out in the original language. There would have been a proper kicking out of people. And what, what, why was he saying that? Is because he knew that unity is worth fighting for, worth protecting, because people see Jesus when we are united. And so I want to encourage us, an awakened church is a united church. This side of the equation is a church that is united because of worshiping one Jesus. Amen. Amen. And then it says that we're in the room. And a sound of rushing wind. It doesn't say wind filled the room. It says the sound of wind filled the room. Imagine being a disciple there. Imagine sitting there. You've been waiting. You've been praying. I don't even know. I don't know if they were fasting. But they've been waiting and praying. And all of a sudden your ears are filled with a sound of wind. But nothing moves. You don't feel your clothes moved by the wind. You don't feel it on your skin. The hairs don't stand up. But your ears are filled with the vibration of a sound. And I love how this passage starts with a sound and then comes the sight of the fire. God begins with a sound and then comes the sight. So often as human beings, we depend on our sight so much. But God... When he created us, I love the way God created us. God gave us the option to close our eyes, but he never gave us the ability to close our ears. He also gave you the ability to close your mouth. Just saying. (laughs) Hashtag. He also gave you the ability to stop using your thumbs. Also, just putting it out there. For those of you who like on the internet and tweeting. But he gave us the ability to close our eyes. Why? Because eyes can be deceived. But we need to keep our ears open to the voice of God. Even at the beginning of creation, what was the first thing God spoke into being? He spoke light. By light we see. And so sometimes we put so much emphasis on vision. But how did God speak light? He spoke it with sound. And so the very thing that birthed vision was vibration. And often in our lives, the way God will birth a vision into our life is by vibration in our hearts. God will speak a word that will give birth to vision. And so I want to encourage us. We've got, to, we've got to pay more attention to the sound God is birthing inside of us. We've got to pay more attention to the sound that's filling the room. What is the new sound that God is stirring up within us? What sound is filling your ears right now? Because the sound that's filling your ears right now is going to give birth to the sound that comes out of your mouth. 
You see, what happened in that moment is the sound that filled the room gave birth to a new sound that came out of the room. The Bible tells us that when they, they gathered together, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they came out speaking in tongues so that everyone understood the message of Jesus that they encountered. We've got to get a new sound filling our ears. We've got to have a new sound in this room so that when we go out, there's a new sound that the world hears. Church, we've got to cross over to the other side so that we don't have the same praise we've always had. We don't have the same worship we've always had. We don't pray the same prayers we've always prayed. It's time for us, church, to get a new sound up inside of us. We've got to praise like we've never praised. We've got to pray like we've never prayed. We've got to worship like we've never worshipped. It's not good enough for us to depend on the old sound. We've got to get a new sound up inside of us. And can I tell you, it's not good enough for us to keep sitting down either. Thank you, Pastor Ronald. And, and Mark, come on now. It's very difficult to get a new sound... When you're so comfy in your seats. There's got to be a new sound that comes out of it. It's got to be a sound that even when a pandemic spreads across the world and we're in lockdown, that sound cuts through the lockdown. It's got to be a sound that cuts through the noise of the world. When everyone's talking about injustices and all that kind of stuff, the church has to rise up and speak about the justice of God. Our sound has to cut through all of that. When the world says our economy is terrible and we've got this unemployment, we rise up and say, no, our sound is the sound of a kingdom economy. We've got a different sound to declare. We've got to have a different sound, church, but we can't shout a different sound if we haven't heard a different sound. So what sound is filling your ears right now? Let it not be my voice. Please, church, my prayer is that my voice is never the voice that's filling your ears. Let it be the Holy Spirit right now. Open your ears to the Spirit of God. Come and fill our ears right now. In this room and on every online right now, just fill our ears, Holy Spirit. Right now, just fill, come Holy Spirit, like that sound of the wind. And let it change the sound that comes out of this room. Let it change the sound that emanates from this place. And then... The scripture says that fire came down. Lord Jesus, would fire come down this morning? Fire comes down and the ESV speaks about how it's a divided fire. The King James Version says that fire comes down as a cloven tongue. Don't you love that phrase? A cloven tongue. Makes you think of like a cow's hoof or something. A cloven tongue. And actually, the fact that they use the word cloven references a, a, a kosher kind of fire, a, a holy fire. But the fire comes down. The, 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 the fire of God comes and comes down on the people. Church, we are a church, we are a people that have been marked by the fire of God. We have to be a church that is on fire and is burning for the, because God has marked us. If we're not on fire, what is the world looking at when they look at us? If we're just a tame little church doing little churchy things, why should the world pay attention to us anyway? But if we're on fire for God, the world loves to look at things that are on fire. The world loves to pay attention to burning things. So we should be on fire. We should be marked by the fire of God. I am a wuss, pure and simple. You didn't think that was coming next, did you? I hate needles. Okay, and so tattoos are not my happy place. I like the idea of tattoos because they they look cool. Also, I'm incredibly hairy, so they would have to find a place where there's no hair growing out. But if I was ever going to be marked by a tattoo, it would be by the fire of God. Because we should be marked by his fire. That's what the church was going to be. It was, a, it was a church that was marked by his fire. Anyway, it speaks about the fire coming down. And depending on how you read it in the original language, it was either two separate flames that rested on each head. Or it was a flame, a single flame that separated at the top into two tongues of fire. Either way, the original language wants us to understand that it was fire that had two portions. It was a double portion of the fire of God. It wasn't a single anointing. It wasn't a single portion. It was double fire on every person. 
God didn't just say, I'm giving you one. He says, no, I'm giving you a double anointing. I'm giving you double. Why is it important that there were two flames? Why does the Bible make sure we read a double flame? Thank you for asking. I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. Go back to the day of Pentecost. What do we celebrate on the day of Pentecost? What are we celebrating? Well, the Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. Yes, it's 50 days after Passover. But what happened 50 days after Passover? 50 days after Passover, Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai. Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai. He's communicating with God. He's in the glory cloud. And God with his finger is inscribing on two stone tablets the letter and the law. Which will eventually be the T's and C's of the old covenant. On the day of Pentecost, what are they celebrating? They are celebrating that Moses came down from the mountain with two stone tablets. That God had inscribed the letter in the law. Two stone tablets inscribed with the law of God. Fast forward generations later, they had been celebrating every year. God had given us the letter and the law inscribed on stone tablets. Fast forward till after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Fast forward to this new birth, this awakening of the church. And we have two tongues of fire on each and every disciple. Not one set of stone tablets, but two tongues of fire on every disciple. What is God saying? God is saying is that no longer will my law be inscribed on two stone tablets, but grace and truth, spirit and power will be inscribed on every heart, in every believer, in every home, in every life. It's no longer one man with one set of stone tablets. It's now available to every believer. Every spiritful believer, their hearts are going to be inscribed by the grace and power of God. No longer do we just carry His Word in a book. Now we are walking testimonies to the glory of God. Because he has inscribed it on our hearts. And we shouldn't have been surprised. This wasn't a surprise. And don't worry, media team. I haven't given you the scripture. Just think, to show you that this shouldn't have been a surprise, right? Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers. On the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God promised to Jeremiah what he did on the day of Pentecost. He said, there will come a day when I will deposit a brand new covenant. But it's not going to happen the same way I did the first one. It's no longer going to be one guy teaching everyone. No, now everyone is going to get a measure of the Spirit inscribed on their very hearts. We are going to be walking testimonies. Church, can we awaken to this this morning? The other side of us awakening is that we're going to be a church that has a brand new start. We're going to be a church that's united. We're going to be a church with a new sound in us and coming out of us. And we're going to be a church marked with a fire of God sealed inside of us. With His grace and power written on our very hearts. It's what God's going to do, but we have the choice. Are we going to awaken? Are we going to step up? Are we going to cross over? I love the fact that the two pictures in this are wind and fire. Wind and fire are not stationary. Wind and fire don't stand still. Wind and fire move. Liberty Church, God is on the move. Liberty Church, God is on the move the move and I don't want to stay here when God's moving over there I don't want to be the church that goes we're happy to be here when God's doing something incredible over here he's bringing nations to their knees he's bringing the glory to cover the earth 
Church, can we cross over to the other side right now? The Holy Spirit's awakening something inside of us, church. The Holy Spirit wants to mark us this morning with His fire. And don't worry, it's not going to be a a sore thing. And I think sometimes we can be like, oh, this sounds freaky. Don't worry, it's not going to be freaky. I might be weird, but the Holy Spirit isn't. I can see some of the looks you've given me, only though, even though you only got this much. And so I'm going to ask us, can we stand? Because I believe in this moment, God wants to do something. God wants to deposit a new sound. God wants to mark us with His fire. And like Cheryl mentioned at the beginning, we can have as much or as little of God as we want. How hungry are we this morning, church? How ready are we to cross over to the other side?